Okay, cool. Our next speech is by a speaker named Eliza Hill, who is an awesome friend and an awesome rock climber. Um, she's a senior in Ellie House, and her speech is entitled, How Many Venezuelans Does It Take to Change the Title? out our tire had just blown out and ripped apart completely, taking off half of our front bumper. For a moment, we drove and slid on the metal rim of the wheel before my dad steered us over to the side of the road to safety. We got out of the car to get the spare, and as luck would have it, the spare was flat. So, let me stop for a moment and provide some context. We were in Venezuela, in the middle of nowhere, about 200 miles outside the capital city, Caracas, where we were living at the time. We were on the shoulder of a two-lane highway surrounded on both sides by dense tropical jungle. That year, Venezuela had the highest murder rate of any country in the world, 50 times higher than Los Angeles at its worst. Our car was a beat-up 17-year-old land cruiser, Shabby by most people's standards, but Venezuela just happened to have a severe car shortage at that time, and Land Cruisers were the most popular car to car jack. So there we were with no cell service, no idea where the nearest town was, and a, high, a, a, flat, a flat spare and a highly covetable car in a dangerous country. Just as we really started to freak out, a tow truck comes out of nowhere and pulls up in front of us. At this point, I'm thinking, who in the world called a tow truck and told us where we were? Told them where we were. It turns out no one had called him. In a country where AAA doesn't exist and cell phone service is shoddy, tow trucks just drive around looking for people to pick up. The tow truck driver put the hook under what was left of our front bumper and hitches our car up. But we still had a problem. There were five of us and there's only room for one passenger in the tow truck. Do we send my dad with the tow truck driver and leave my mom, me, my sister and brother on the side of the highway? Or do we send my mom with this strange man? But the tow truck driver had a much simpler solution. We would all just ride in our car, which is now hitched up at a 45 degree angle, attached to the tow truck by nothing but a rusty chain. So we hop in and start driving slowly down the highway, hoping the chain doesn't snap. My dad is holding on to the like totally useless steering wheel and we can't even see where we're going because we can only see the hood of the car we're at such a high angle. Soon we arrive in a tiny town, and I should mention now that it is a Sunday in a Catholic country, so the chances of finding a mechanic shop that's actually open are very small. A few guys are sitting outside the only store in the tiny town. They saw us and laughed, waving their hands in a way that meant we were, there was no way we would find a tire there. So we got back on the highway and drove to another tiny town where the exact same thing happened. The third town was a little bigger and had a mechanic shop, which was, of course, closed. We stopped there anyways. Across the dirt road from us, three high school-aged boys wearing dirty wife beaters were leaning back against their very old El Camino. After a while, they walk over, and one says to my dad, Hey, doctor! which is just slang, it's like a slang greeting in Venezuela. But my dad didn't know this, and he thought they just somehow knew he was a doctor. <laughs> my dad uses a little Spanish and a lot of arm motions to show them our 
busted tire. The boys say they know where to find a tire and motion for my dad to get in their El Camino. There were a lot of reasons that this seemed like a bad idea. We didn't know these boys. We were a little scared of them. My dad had a lot of cash on him because Venezuela is a cash economy and we were on a weekend trip to the beach. Their car barely looked functional. But we didn't have a lot of options, so my dad threw the spare in their trunk and drove off with the boys in their El Camino. Our fears of being kidnapped or worse were not completely unfounded. I mentioned before Venezuela's astonishing murder rate and diplomatic or socioeconomic status were not shields against violence. During my two years in Venezuela, two of my teachers were kidnapped, another is beaten up and robbed. The doctor my dad worked with was carjacked at gunpoint twice. One of my best friend's dad was shot six times walking out of the pharmacy with his 10-year-old son. Thankfully, they both survived, but all of those events fueled our fear. Back in the El Camino, my dad and the three boys are now well out of town. First, they come upon a row of roofless cinder block stalls. One is full of nearly rotten bananas, another is full of mismatched shoes, and the third is full of tires. A man in a lawn chair sits outside of each stall. The boys hold up our flat tire to the tire vendor and he pokes around in his pile, but he doesn't have a match. So they drive on. Next they come across another man. This time there's no cinder block stall. He's just sitting under a palm tree in a field with a pile of tires behind him. The boys hold up the spare. He looks through his pile, but he doesn't have a match either. Luckily, the third black market tire vendor has a match. The tire is noticeably smaller than our spare, but it would fit. The boys bargain with the tire vendor, get some cash from my dad to pay him. They hop back in the El Camino, ready to come back to us, but the car won't start. While all of this was going on, my sister, brother, mom, and I are still sitting in our car which is still jacked up at a 45 degree angle. It's smoldering hot outside. We are clearly not from around there, so even though we probably like water, we don't get out of our car. After about a half hour, my mom and I start wondering how long we should wait before we start to panic. And if my dad doesn't come back, what do we tell people? Oh yeah, he drove off that way in an El Camino with three boys and uh, there was no license plate on the car. So, somehow, even though my dad's phone was useless, the boys had cell service. So they called a taxi. A few minutes later, a taxi pulls up. The taxi driver had a tumor on his forehead that I kid you not was as big as half of a grapefruit. Luckily for my dad, whose Spanish was okay at the time, the taxi driver was from Trinidad, so he spoke English. And luckily for the taxi driver, my dad is a doctor, so he talked to the guy about his tumor. He drove my dad and one of the boys back to the town. The others stayed to try and fix the El Camino. We were all very relieved to see my dad come back, but also confused about why he had come back in a different car with a different driver. He explained all of that later. We finally got the new tire on the car, which now leaned to the right because the new tire was so small. And we sorted out payment with the taxi driver, the El Camino boy, and the tow truck driver. The whole ordeal actually ended up taking less than two hours and only cost us about $200. If we'd been in the same situation in the U.S., I doubt we would have been back on the road sooner. I often have a hard time explaining to my friends what it was like to live in Venezuela, because things there work in ways that I could not have imagined before living through them. 
It's easy to see Venezuela as completely dysfunctional. It's a country plagued by corruption, violence, and economic and political turmoil. And things have sadly gotten worse even since I lived there. It's hard to imagine how people's lives go on in the midst of such chaos. But as demonstrated by our flat tire, things may get done in very different ways than we're used to, but life does go on.